There's benefits to fiberglass, certainly, but I think that th those benefits, which are primarily that it's supposed to be it's more rigid. It's yeah, it's gonna it's gonna feel sturdier. Mm -hmm. Like when you climb up, and it's gonna feel more rock solid, like an aluminum ladder will like kind of flex. Yep. They're supposed to, you know, if you tap a power line with it. I mean, I've never done that, and I don't know anybody who has. I've never heard of anybody being electrocuted as an adjuster. I mean, if you tap a power line with a aluminum ladder, you might get zinged. Right. You might end up, you know, in the newspaper um, or being carried out of the newspaper. Um. <laughs> <laughs> this is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at adjustertv.com slash paysetter and by e &O provider Kaplik. Download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Hey, what is up? Matt here with Adjuster TV and for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe now on here on uh, YouTube. If you're listening to this on as a podcast, run over to iTunes and give us a five star review. I mean, why not? Why not just ask for it? Um, so today, me and Mr. James Mathis Hello. are going to talk about a couple of things, not the least of which is how to be fast. I mean, we talk about production, right? You know, well, you got to close X number of claims a year. You know, in our last podcast, we were talking about that a little bit. So how do you do that? I mean, how do you have high production, still have a good quality product, and still have time to have a good cut? customer service score right because you got to spend a little time with the homeowner the insurer the, even the contractors and everybody else right so how do we do that um i also want to talk a little bit about um which ladders to get ladder or ladders and why and maybe talk a little bit about you know little ladder safety and vehicles you know with regards to ladders um what's the shortest long ladder that you need i mean we had you we had that conversation earlier yeah. this week. Yeah, we got on the phone about so. that. And of course, you know, our uh, stories from the road. So let's jump into it. So okay. uh, let's start with ladders. Ladders. So as a field adjuster doing property claims, when property, of course, is, means houses and commercial property structures, mm -hmm. right? Many times you're going to have deployments, whether it's a, a deployed daily situation or CAT, where... All your claims, you need to get on a roof. Or you may have those deployments uh, where you're running claims where none of your claims, you're getting on any roofs at all. Like if you're a flood adjuster, right. if you're doing water claims, like yeah. sewer backup claims, that kind of thing. Right? So, and in some parts of the country, in some neighborhoods in every part of the country, you're going to find two-story structures and probably mostly one story because they're, you know, well... I don't know if they're easier to build necessarily. They're probably not cheaper because two, going up is cheaper than going out. Right. Um, but you're going to, you know, it, it, long story short, at some point in your career, you're going to have to uh, climb on a roof, right? You're going to have to get up there. And, and you don't want to have to count on and rely on other people to help you get up there all the time. I get questions from people, you know, what if I don't want to climb roofs? Or what if I'm not able to climb roofs? What if I'm, you know, imperfectly reasonable? scared to climb roofs i mean it's a natural you know probably highly intelligent you know desire to not want to hurt yourself climbing up and down a ladder 20 times a day i know a guy that owned a roofing company that was scared to climb roofs yeah, yeah i've met some he said he wasn't scared of heights he was just scared of dying yeah, right? yeah, yeah. so so <clears throat> what kind of ladder is is what works um i want to talk a little bit about kind of what i started with and what i ran with and and i tried different things and as i was you know in our phone conversation i told you i probably have purchased at least two dozen ladders in my the, the, the all the time that i was running claims you know trying out a little giant those suckers are heavy they're good heavy. ladders but i mean oh they weigh God, a bazillion heavy. pounds and you can they don't you, you can get a lighter ladder that's easier to deploy and it's also you know not 500 bucks um, my fir very first ladder was a, I can't remember the brand name of it, but I don't think they make them anymore or they're not around anymore, but it was a folding ladder. It was a, like an 18 foot and it had a, instead of the buttons, like the mm -hmm. knobs or the little tiny switches, it had a lever, like a bar that oh, went across. You probably remember those. I've seen those. And you could flip that sucker out in like no time flat once you got used to it. 
Um, on my very first claim, I was my very first ever claim. Um, I was riding along with uh, a woman who was a an RT for State Farm. She was a reinspector trainer, and it was my first storm. They knew it, so they sent me out with her, and. I set my ladder up, get, you know, it's bungled around with it. She's standing there talking to the homeowner and I'm trying to get this ladder open. I get it all straightened out and lift it up and put it on the house. And, you know, she's like, all right, well, let's climb, up, let's climb this thing and, you know, take a look at it. And she goes to climb up it and she puts her hand on it and it folds in half and like catch the, the lock catches and it falls over into the, into the bushes. And she's like, are you trying to kill me on our first claim? <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry. You know, I was so embarrassed. <laughs> Um, and that was a great ladder. It wore out eventually and started, it broke and then I couldn't find him anymore. But, um, you know, it did a lot of, I was, it was in Chicago it was my first tournament. It was tons of double pulls, mm-hmm. right? Which is, you're not supposed to do the official don't do double pulls. The official line is don't do double pulls. Um, and I'll tell you, don't do them cause they're extremely, extremely dangerous. dangerous. I mean, I can't even begin to tell you how dangerous they are because you know, it's the typical double pull scenario, the safest double pull scenario on a peak is, yeah, you're setting the, you flip the ladder upside down. If, if it's got a bar, like my first ladder had a bar across the bottom, mm-hmm. like a, a wide right. thing. And you couldn't put that on the peak because it wouldn't stay there. So you had to flip it over so that th- that was on the top, you know? So you'd set it on a peak and then you'd lean it onto the upper roof. So it's kind of locked into that peak, right? So it sticks up. And it's pretty secure, but you got to get it up there, which if you're pulling it up and you slip, I mean, you can go down right off the roof just p- trying to get yep. it up onto the, the first story, right? A lot of people have been severely injured or killed um, by doing double pulls. So don't do double pulls. Um, but you still got to get on that second story a lot of the time, right? If for nothing else, to take a look at it to see how many vents are back there. Um, so for a long time, um, just because, not just because I was like, didn't want to do double pulls or I was scared of them or like, uh, cause I, I did them. I mean, I had a lot of them. Um, it, it just took too much time to pull the ladder up, lean it up against the thing, climb up there and then whatever. When I could do, if it's front and back slope, right? Oh, upper roof has a front and back slope and then the lower roof is a front and back slope and it's just the same directional slope yep. so there's only two main two directional right. directions <clears throat> um do your test squares on the, the lower slope and you're, you're done go to the back the, the the back fence in the backyard and count the number of vents write those down you know you can get the the rafter measurement standing there pretty accurate measurement that just by standing underneath and, and running your tape up the fascia or whatever um so you don't have to. You save time doing that, right? This is and we're, when we're t- going to talk about speed, and this is one of the things where I, I think that you know you can you can save five minutes, which adds up, right? Especially if you're in, in a neighborhood and they're all the same house, and you know you don't have to climb that second story. Don't climb it. You know right. you might miss out on the twenty dollar two story fee, but you know maybe you closed an extra, two extra claims that day because you saved some time, right? Because you, you were able to be faster, but. There's a lot of places in the country where everybody's got two-story roofs, and they're super steep, like Dallas. I mean, it feels like, you know. They're all steep there. They're all steep. They're not necessarily There's a lot of two-stories, but they're mostly just stupid, cut-up, steep roofs for no reason other than aesthetics. Aesthetics, and and Bob has one, so i got to have one, too. Yep, yep. It's just ridiculous. You want to get up on a two-story roof, um, you know, you, you think, all right, well, inside a house, if you're doing the math, the ceiling is to four to ceiling in most houses is eight foot, right? So if you have two stories and that's 16 foot, you know, 16 foot ladder, if that's the actual math, which it's not, isn't going to get you up on the roof, all right? Because you're going to have to have it back a little bit. So it leans over onto the house and that's your, you know, if it's, if it was exactly 16 foot from the ground to the, the gutter and you lean your ladder over, you're messing, right? Cause it's the, right. the same length. Um, a 22 foot ladder. See, we did this math the other day. So we did the math. The joists for the floor are 10, usually 12 inches, right? So there's going to be an extra foot there for the, the downstairs, unless it's on a slab. And then for the, the joists that are between the first floor and the second floor, another 12 inches. And then there's going to be joists 
for the ceiling upstairs and upstairs. So that's three extra feet. Plus, probably the ground is graded away from the house a little bit to keep to shed water away right. from the foundation. If it's got a, if it's got a foundation or like a walkout basement, there may be six inches or four feet of concrete from that foundation showing on the front side of the house. So, so then you've got you know that's another you know 16 plus whatever that is I and mean, it's like 24 feet at least so you, so i think that i i ended up running with uh a 24 foot ladder my optimal like setup was a 24 foot ladder and a 32 foot ladder and i could get on most things with a 24 footer um but some things i couldn't which is where the 32 foot ladder came in and both of them were aluminum because aluminum's light I had a 28 foot fiberglass. I, mean, I sold that sucker, and yeah, that, that's, that's the heaviest you'll thing. You throw your back out, and you get. I'm up, too old for that stuff, man. And the wind blows. Oh yeah, and it's going down. I, I dumped my. I bought one of those, and dumped it in people's front yards trying to get it up by myself. You know, yeah. it's you got to do like a pole vault thing. Yeah, <laughs> you know? plan and walk it up, but it's so heavy at the top, and then yeah, and then it's they're so heavy that ropes don't last long. You yeah. Know, that, it's just it's bad want to work from home i thought that might get your attention i'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the ia firm paysetter claim service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work which let's be honest really just means work at home in your pjs still want to work in the field though paysetters evo platform is fully integrated with hover it is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm, and you can find both at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. So you carry the 24 and a 32. Yep. And I think that, that um, we came up with a scenario where, you know, most roofs, most to, depending on where you're at, 26, 28 foot is probably going to get you on most roofs. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, truth is, not everybody has a vehicle that can carry a 32 foot ladder or a 20 or 28 foot extension ladder, you know, and Little Giant's heavy, yeah. you know. I think their longest one's 26 foot, uh, 26 or 28. Yeah. Imagine how heavy that thing is. Oh, I had I had one for a day. <laughs> uh, I actually bought it. I actually bought it. Got to the house, and it barely peeked over the barely peeked over the edge. And uh, I just looked. I said, "That's not safe." You yeah. know, I took a picture of it. You know, like it was. Mm -hmm. Sent it to my field manager, and I got uh, I got ladder assist paid for. Nice. But I had to reschedule and go back. You know, right? Wait, right. But anyway, and then it was like no damage. And, you know, anyway. It's impractical, you know, just, just to, to answer that question. Oh, so that was a 20, I take that back. That was a 24 foot ladder. Yeah. That was not a 26. If I had a 26, it would have been enough yeah. on that roof. It's impractical to have ladder assist meets you out on every claim. Yeah. Right. It just doesn't. It's a lot of money. Um, either you're going to have to pay for it out of the pocket or you're going to have to get it approved. Yeah. Uh, if you get, if you're in a situation where you're getting way too many, asking for way too many, um, they'll start pulling claims. You know, they'll, they'll just send somebody else. I, uh, what I'm carrying right now, um, because of the Subaru, I have a 17 foot Warner that's, you know, it's a fold, you know, it's a combination folding telescoping mm -hmm. ladder. Um, I've got that and I have a 14 foot telescoping ladder, you know, it's 300, yeah. it's 325 pound rated telescoping ladder. But yeah, I, I, I agree. You, you really need to carry it. What do they say? The guy with the longest ladder is the gets the most stays the longest on a storm maybe that's why i stayed so long on the storms yeah um <laughs> the the more you know the more uh the bigger the ladder you have the longer the ladder the more doors claims you're gonna get you yeah. know the more opportunities you're gonna get so yeah you're if you're especially if you're running dailies man um and i'm evaluating my equipment right now the direction i'm gonna go i mean i've even talked about getting a truck you know uh, trying to sure. do everything I, but i'd like to if i can if i can make the the little giant work, even though it's heavy. And, and the truth is, I am i don't get that many two-story claims to begin with. But having that 28-foot that ladder that I had, that, that fiberglass, you know, 
I didn't think twice. I mean, no matter what claim they sent to me, I mean, I didn't pull it up online first and look at it. Can I do that or not? I I take the claim, man, and move on. And and so you don't have to worry about things the bigger ladder that you have. You don't have to sweat it. Don't ever buy fiberglass. Just telling you. Yeah. There's benefits to fiberglass, certainly. But I think that those benefits, which are primarily that it's supposed to be. It's more rigid. It's yeah. It's gonna it's gonna feel sturdier. Mm-hmm. Like when you climb up, and it's gonna feel more rock solid. Like an aluminum ladder will like kind of flex. Yep. They're supposed to you know if you tap a power line with it. I mean, I've never done that, and I don't know anybody who has. I've never heard of anybody being electrocuted as an adjuster. I mean, if you tap a power line with a aluminum ladder, you might get zinged. Right. You might end up you know in the newspaper. Um, or being carried out of the newspaper. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you sweep you up on these and put you inside. <laughs> yeah, and, but they're so heavy. I mean, it is a workout to get that sucker straight up and down. And anybody like short, I'm six foot tall. I mean, anybody shorter than me, I don't know. Like me. Unless you've got like some massive, you know, quads and you do squats and deadlifts. You know, getting that, because you got to do like that pole vault thing to get it up in the air. And yep. then you have to have straight up and down pull the rope to, to raise the, the top part and then lean it over into the house. And that's if the wind is blowing at all and you lose control of that. I mean, you're taking out the neighbor's window and the bushes and I've had them fall down in people's front yards. Um, but so fiberglass, I would say no, in spite of its benefits, you know, it's a little more secure feeling, right. um, you know, have a greater weight carrying capacity. I go with aluminum, you know, the main things that we're using ladders for is, you know, from our perspective as a field adjuster is that we are, we, we don't want to have to, like, I, like you just said, you know, rely on other people or have to like pull it up on street view to see if it's, you know, it, that you, if you can get on it or not, mm-hmm. you, you just can get on it. Right. My 32 foot ladder, I got a, two, a 32 foot ladder because I had a few that the 28 foot was like this peaking up this much above the gutter. And I was like, 32 would give me four more feet, which is like, that's safety and security, especially when you're coming back down the slope and you grab it. And you're, I mean, you could be 30 feet off the ground. I mean, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a short drop. Um, so we, we, we want to be able to be able to take any, any claim, never give a claim back. Right. That's my policy was never to give one back under really any circumstances, unless super rare. Um, the other thing we need ladders for is accessing attics because not everybody's got a yep. pull down stair thing in the middle of their hallway upstairs. They may have a little like, you know, but maybe this big hole in the ceiling in their linen closet. Right. And you has, it has a little piece of plywood that's painted to match the ceiling and you push that thing up and slide it over. And then if you have to get up into the attic, then you got to squirm your way up in there. You need a little ladder. A telescoping ladder is perfect for that because you can take, raise it out only as far as you need it. And, you know, slide that thing and wiggle it into the closet, climb up there. 90% of the time, especially on hail or wind, you're, you're not going all the way into the attic. You just want to get up and look and see if they, what kind of decking they have underneath the shingles. Because if you see there's two layers and they have wood shake or wood shingle under the wood, or they have it's just wood, a wood shake roof. You have to take before you can pay for any plywood because the contractor is going to put plywood on his, on his estimate. Especially if they go back, if they tear off wood and put on uh, comp, which is what you're going to pay for. You have to pay for plywood if it's space decking and it's one by sixes that are one, two, four, or five inches apart, and that's how they put the the wood shakes on. Um, you can't do you can't put comp on top of that. Uh, on space decking. So you need a picture of that. Long story short, you have that in the file, you throw in, you know, install of half inch CDX, which is going to add two grand here, your estimate easily. Bada bing, bada boom. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that can bump up your fee bill, make everybody happy. You don't have to, there's no supplement for plywood. You took care of it. It took five extra minutes to do this. Right. And you, you, you may, you may have made more money. Um, so you need a ladder that you can is easy to deploy. Like the twenty four foot aluminum ladder is pretty, relatively speaking, is pretty light, right? Mm-hmm. If you get the two hundred twenty five pound, um, if you're me, the two twenty five one, and 
it's you can slide it same one up on just about any gutter on any any one story you know don't even have to pull it up right. you just strap it off to the gutter and away you go so you just take it off the top of the car and put it on the house right there's no unfolding it there's no nothing um, and then have the long one for the rare, the rare, like I mean, you might get an apartment building. It's got three stories or two and a half or whatever. And you, and you need that extra, you know, the 32 footer and then having a little one inside. You can, you can literally look at everything. There's, I mean, the rarest possible exception is, um, big, big, like three story apartment buildings, but you're going to meet a contractor out there and he's going to have a 40 foot ladder or they have a little access roof thing door on the roof that you can walk out of. I, I had an eight, eight story apartment building and it was like a, it was basically a skyscraper with a hip roof on it, which was, and it was up in Wisconsin. It's gotta be scary. It was, a, it was, there was a pucker factor there cause the wind was blowing <laughs> and you like, you like crank this like, you know, lever down for the door and you start to push it open and the wind caught it, and slammed it open and it was like, you know, you walk out on it and the whole roof is sloping away from you. It's like you're standing on yeah. top of a mountain and you can see Lake Winnebago or Lake whatever in yeah. Madison. And what lake was that? Lake, uh, somebody's going to comment hopefully and tell me what lake that was. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but you'll, you'll come across situations like that, right? I did, I don't know if I told you this, I did the ladder assist in New Jersey for yeah. like hurricane. It wasn't even a hurricane. I don't remember what it was for. Um, but I put a 40 foot ladder on that forerunner and it was looked ridiculous. And I was in Patterson and I was meeting with, uh, an adjuster and a contractor and I set the ladder up and it was those, those like row houses with a little driveway between them. And they're, they're, right. it was every, you know, I had this much of the, the 40 foot ladder extended all the way, sticking above the gutter on one side of the, the building I put it up and it's like, Oh, I gotta, we gotta go take a look at the thing on the other side of the building. Go over to the other side of the building, and you hear this, kapow! And I was like, oh, no. And I ran around to the other side of the building, and the ladder was laying perfectly down the middle of the driveway. No scratches, no broken windows on anything. And I was like, oh, no. But deploying that, I mean, talk about doing the, right. the pole vault maneuver and getting it all the way up, leaning it over. And then you got to climb all the way up there. You're climbing. You're still climbing. And the thing's doing this, you know. And you bungee it off. And then you step up onto the roof. And... You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, Head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. You know, as far as equipment and ladders go, I actually saw it. It was a while back. Guy has guy had a small SUV, and he he was tired of his telescoping ladder, and he but he was just not going to buy another vehicle you know he knew he needed a truck this guy bought a utility trailer okay built the racks on it put his ladders on there and it's got a box on it he can store other stuff inside there and he drags that around when he's doing his inspections he built himself a claim trailer that he huh. pulls he pulls around behind him and he's got he says i've got all my inspection tools in it He's got the compartments made and all that stuff. It was a flatbed trailer is what it started off to be. Yeah. And then he built the rack, had the racks built on it and everything else. And he's carrying around a 32-foot ladder on that trailer. And he's got his other ladders on it. He's got step ladders on it, too. And he's got, you know, like I said, the compartments, boxes that he's built onto yeah. it. Everything he needs right there. End of the day, you know, he just backs it up in his driveway and parks it there or i think that's where he parks it as the driveway and then and he said there's days that he doesn't even have to take it with him because he knows what kind of claims that he's running so all he takes is just his telescoping ladder and a few things that's it but when yeah. he has to have the bigger ladders that's what he drags with him and then yeah. he he said he takes it on deployment i've never, i haven't seen the guy I, i'd be just curious as to how that really works on a deployment you right know, 
you know, especially some of the houses you go to, you might have a driveway up a hill and you got to turn. Ooh, but wow. if it's light enough, you can just turn your car around and then flip the trailer around, rehook it, and, yeah, and move yeah. on. But like, it's got to be awkward, you know. But hey, if it works, yeah, you know, if it works. There was a guy. Um, so I have full time in an RV back in oh three to like oh seven or eight, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, when I was single, and I had a fifth wheel toy hauler and i you know once once i got a harley i put the harley in the back and anyway <clears throat> but i would stay at the at campgrounds right and i had a couple of friends that also were rv rving adjusters my buddy jimmy and then um another guy and his wife daryl kim and daryl and if they're watching this how you guys doing daryl and daryl yeah um and they had this this little uh, Jack Russell Terrier named Jerry, who was I loved him. They're like, don't throw the ball, don't throw because I was like picking up the tennis ball and I threw it. And then the rest of the night I'm throwing the ball. Like he's going to get it. And anyway, so he had um, Daryl had a motorhome that he pulled a twenty something foot, twenty six foot car hauler enclosed car trailer, mm -hmm. and he he had a little like an S10 pickup that he, he pulled in there that when they were driving between storms or whatever. And then when they got to the storm site, he pulled the, the pickup truck out and that's what he ran claims in. And he had desks and cubbies and printers and all kinds of stuff in the trailer that he's, that they set up and she That'd would make phone cool. calls for him. like, it was her office. And, then, and at the end of the, end of the day, he would come in there and write, write stuff up. And I thought that was a pretty cool, pretty slick way to do things. And I mean, they ran claims like that and they, they've, I know he's he'd been doing claims. They weren't sleeping in it though, right? No, they right. they slept in the motorhome. Right. Okay. Um, and then we'd sit outside and drink beer all night every night. I, cool. ga I gained like 15 pounds on that storm, just, just by drinking. It. Just that sounds like me in Louisiana last year. Yeah. So that was that was bad. Yeah. So. <laughs> you know, and speaking of which, you know, I I've and not to go too far into this because I'm, we actually have another podcast that I'm, I uh, did with. Um, some folks at Paysetter mm -hmm. talking about traveling and, and well, like health and fitness when you're on, when you you live on the road. And I've done, I've done that where I've gained a bunch of weight. I've done it where I worked out every night and like, you know, got ripped and everything. And then back and forth between those two things over the years. Um, but there's a way to, to be like healthy and not be fat and sad and in pain. And you know, I lost over 30 pounds this year. No, nice. And then this last month has been so hectic and crazy and everything else. I gave about ten of it back, yeah. ten twelve back. Yeah. So it's it's tough, man. Especially when you get into an area like you know or a situation like I've been in, and you're just running, you know, and there's no time. Yeah. And and I didn't. I was actually two places I stayed at. I didn't have access to a kitchen or refrigerator. You know, it's just like yeah hamburgers cooking are, yourself is, is a big part of it hamburgers are good <laughs> yeah they are <laughs> potatoes <laughs> cheeseburger um do you think i think we you feel like we got the ladder question answered do you think people are gonna yeah you know if you get so if you still have questions about ladders and stuff and what you know what you should use and, and, the, and maybe the vehicle maybe we talk about vehicles for a minute and before we move on but but uh i've had either suv or like a one ton or like a full size pickup truck. Right. Um, and having a pickup truck is pretty nice because you can, you put a ladder rack on it and then you can just throw whatever you want on there. Literally, it says you could put a 60 foot ladder on there and it wouldn't yep. be a big deal. Um, but the SUVs worked out really well for me because everything's enclosed. Lock your stuff up inside. You lock your stuff up and you've got the back area where you have a couple of bins with stuff in it, you know. And I can't open my back gate with, with the ladders on. So I'll lower the back window, pull my cougar paws out, grab whatever, I need. my tool belt will be back there or whatever, and then <coughs> do the claim, throw that stuff back in, roll the window back up, turn on the AC full blast, and get to work. Um, the SUV worked out pretty well. Um, it's hard to beat a full-size pickup truck. I, I would... For comfort and... I regret. I mean, I love my Subi, you know? I mean... We've done 40,000 miles this year. Nice. You know, um, it has a lot of great qualities and features. I mean, all, you know, I've, I lifted it, put off-road tires on it, you know. Yeah. Um, I can go anywhere. I don't have to worry about 
anything. I mean, I'm up here with ice on the roads this morning and snow and, and no problem getting around. Yeah. Great. I've, I've gone up some hills. I mean, when I was in Washington, I had some places that they were off the grid, man. I mean, ruts all the way up, you know, mud went right up there. I guarantee you if I was in a pickup truck that didn't have a locking rear differential or something like that or another car, I would have never got up there. Yeah. You know, right. I think even a four wheel drive in that scenario would have had a difficult time. You would have made it, but it, it would have had a hard time. But the all wheel drive was fantastic. Um, and, I, and I love it. And, and it's, you know, I don't get that much better gas mileage than the truck does because I've lifted it and put heavier tires on it. And I have a, a basket on it uh, with a ladder on top of it. So it just kills the aerodynamics and the fuel economy. <laughs> right. I like it. But if I had to do it all over again, I would definitely um, stick with a pickup truck and I would get a full, I would get a full size truck and I would get four wheel drive. You know, yeah, I wouldn't get a pickup truck that wasn't four wheel drive under any yeah. circumstances, yeah, especially in this job because of the places that you may have to go. Yeah, um, I mean, I, and I've I've run claims in Houston, and oh yeah, if a, if a dark cloud like floats over the city, all of the storm rains yeah. flood. There would be eighteen inches of water in the street in twenty minutes, yep. and that, it's having that forerunner has helped in, in a lot of situations where the, there's a lot of water like that, or you know, snowy roads. Whatever. I will say, you know, if we're talking about vehicles, we might as well, you know, we might as well talk about vehicles because people will ask me, hey, sh which truck should I get? I'm brand new. I just got my license. Which vehicle? Da -da -da. Like, first of all, the vehicle you got. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. Don't don't be going by a truck or a SUV or whatever. As long as your vehicle is roadworthy, if you're going to if you if you're going to have if, if you've got a late model car that is your not quite sure that it would make it a, a, a two day, you know, road trip across the country on the interstate that might break down. Take the money that you, that you were going to put on your down payment and put into this new vehicle and car payments and stuff and take it to a dealer or take it to a really good local mechanic and say, find everything wrong with it and let's just get it fixed. Right. I, and that's one of the reasons why I have 540,000 miles on that, that, that foreigner now is because that's what I do. Just tell me what you know, I got to replace the water pump and the timing this month or next month, probably. Um, yeah. But keep the maintenance up on it, man. And it lasts it'll run. I think most, most, most will. I mean, it's Toyota. I mean, which they, they start off with good engineering, but I think it, really any vehicle, if you, if you keep up with the maintenance, always get the oil changed. If they say, you know, oh, your power steering fluid, don't drive it like it's NASCAR. Right. Don't it's just be hard for me. You know, fast starts and hard braking or ruin a car fast. You know, so just don't speed. Just anyway. Okay, Grandpa. Yeah. Well, listen. <laughs> save me a lot of money. All right. I think I, I I calculated the other day. I got places to go, man. <laughs> <laughs> These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field. Or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had a car payment in over 10 years because I just paid that one. I bought a brand new and I paid it off um, in three years. And I have saved, forgetting about maintenance and fuel and all that kind of stuff, I've saved over $100,000 by not having a car payment for the there last you. 10 years. There you. So, I don't know. So if you, you use the vehicle that you, that you have in hand, whether it's a car, 
You could put a, a luggage rack, you know, like a third, uh, like a Thule or, or right. a Yakima or whatever on there, and you can put you can put a twenty four foot ladder on there. It's it might look a little funny, but it's going to work, right? right? And it's going to be safe, especially if you if it's in, the luggage rack is installed and it's it's rate, rated to hold a lot of weight. Um, it'll be fine, right? You don't need a pickup truck to do this job. You don't need an SUV to do this job. You can have a little station wagon or Subaru or whatever. You just make it work, right? Run with that for as long as you can it, to, and make sure that this is a year from now, you're not doing something else with an expensive truck payment because you decided to, you know, that you right. weren't going to, you, you weren't ended up being not all in on it. Um, give it some time, get some deployments under your belt. You know, you may decide that you love driving around a car because you get, you know, 35 miles to the gallon, right? You may love that, which I would love that. I don't get that. I get, um, I get 20. Yeah. I'm lucky to get. 16 before i lifted it and did all the stuff to it i got 31 yeah exactly <laughs> now I'm getting 20. yeah i put i just put smaller tires on mine because i i had 33 inch tires and now i have 31s and i picked up five miles to the gallon it was ridiculous anyway so that's my advice <clears throat> with regard to vehicles is just run with what you have decide if this is going to be for you if it's the kind of you know because it's it's relentless it's hard work but at the end of the year if you've got you know several hundred claims closed, I think it's worth it. Right. Yeah. Um, and then decide if you want to get a, you know, another vehicle that's going to be, that'll, that'll make, it'll make it easier for you to close more claims. I mean, that'd be the criteria I'd go with. When I started off, I had the F-150 and it was a six and a half foot bed and I had a fiberglass top on it that had a rack on top of that, that, you know, I could haul stuff on top of, I had the long bed on it, you know, it was, it was a great truck. The downside of it was it was a two-wheel. It was a, it was just a truck truck. It was not. It was a not a fancy truck at all. Yeah. It didn't. It was not four-wheel drive. And I refer to it as a city truck, you know. And it, no no locking rear differential or anything like that. And it, uh, you know, hey, it got the job done. It had a EcoBoost engine in it. it. Pulled my trailer, all that other stuff. Yeah. But man, if I went to if I went any place that had just the least bit of slick. You know, roads or mud or anything, I was done. I mean, yeah, right. what convinced me actually to get rid of it was I was backing a trailer, backing a boat into the lake, and the the lake had been down, and the moss that was on there, it got wet. And that stuff is like ice sometimes. I'm backing, I hit the brakes, and I just keep sliding backwards mm -hmm. going into the water. And finally I stopped, and but I couldn't get traction to get out, and a guy had to, we had to put a tow rope on me. A toe strap on me with a guy on a four-wheel drive had to pull me out. That's why I was like, don't that truck. The other thing was, is I was on my, I'd already replaced turbos on it. I'm about to replace the turbos again. Only had 90,000 miles on a three-year-old truck. So I was like, yeah, I'm just done with this one. I need to get something a little bit better. So I, so I, I got the Subaru. Subaru, I, whatever I bought the Subaru, I, I wasn't really sure what, if I was going to stick in property that time, I mean, it was like if if I was going to do property, I was going to do some of the stuff I was doing, just some of the small water loss stuff I was doing locally, and and I thought I was in, anyway. It and, and I bought what I thought was best for me at the time, you know, and I still think it's a good vehicle, and I'm still going to run it. But um, if I were to replace it, it would be either with a full size truck, or I'd get a Sprinter van. Yeah, you know, Sprinter van, longer wheelbase. You can put a bed platform in the. You put a platform in the back. Put a bed on it. So that way you can sleep on the side of the road when you're tearing from one place to another, or you get to an area that you're having a hard time finding lodging. You can normally find camp spots at K KOAs. Mm -hmm. Just sleep in there, shower in their showers. Yeah, right you know, stop, until you can, or until you can find someplace else. You can you can stay in it. You can put compartments in it and everything else, and you can also get your ladders in it. Yeah, you know. That would probably it would be one of those two things I would switch to yeah. if I if I replace it. That, but, um, however, getting started in this business, you know, well, what should I go buy? Nothing. Yeah. Stick with what you got, man. Run it till the wheels fall off. Till you just till either a you know that this is your career and you're making and you're doing good and you're you're stable in it and you're pretty confident you're going to continue to get work, and then you might jump out and grab something else. Um, or till the wheels fall off, man. Yeah, for you know? sure. I mean, there's, I mean, yeah, we talk about being able to haul a two-story ladder, you know. Um, and yes, not having a two-story ladder can limit you to some some degree, but it's not going to kill your career by not having one. No. You know. Yeah. It does limit you some, but not completely. 
No. I mean, it, it, there was, I had many summers where I, I never touched the 30, 32 foot ladder. I was yeah. a 24 foot ladder the whole time. Yeah. Um, I will say to disabuse people who ask this question, um, don't think that you're going to buy a Sprinter van or an RV and just, you know, sleep in it at night and then drive to your claims during the day and then sleep in it at night and drive to your claims during the day. Because if you've never owned an RV before, you don't know what you don't know. And that is once you park it in a campground and you, you get it all settled in, you want, it's a pain in the butt to like unhook everything, hook everything back up. I mean, you could do it. It can be done. It's not that big of a pain in the rear, but man, every single day. Yep. And for what? Uh, it's just, you know, All right. So I don't know, but, uh, let's talk about going fast. You know, we talk about production production. How does a guy go fast? What is James? What is, what speed hacks, speed secrets does James Mathis has he incorporated in his workflow in his day? Macros. Okay. Yeah. So macros are, are my best friend. Um, you, and then, so I'm writing multiple carriers, different carriers have different guidelines for a wall repair, for a roof repair, yeah, for a roof replacement. So I have macros for every carrier that I work for and, I, and I've got it labeled what it is. And then all I've got to do is just drop them in, change my, change my, uh, square footage, you know? label my photos move on yeah that's that's yeah. pretty much it and for people who don't know what a macro is the for the four of you out there <laughs> <laughs> in exactimate you can create a you know get into a room and put it create a list of line items for a particular repair right so you right. say you're going to replace a roof or just like a rolled roofing or just water spot on the ceiling or just baseboard or just doors or just whatever, right? Or you can make a gigantic long one that's got all that stuff in it, right? It's a even, little practical. Even my F9 notes are included in that. Yeah, the way, and so. you, put, you have your notes and everything in there so that when you recall, you, you save it as a, they call it a macro. I don't think it's, I guess that's what, it's like a template. No, it's a macro. It says macro. Yeah. No, it's no, macro. it says, that's what it says in there, but it says run, but. Uh, it says run macro. So anyway. So you save that macro, and then when you run the macro later, you, you recall it, basically. You just open it up, and you, you say, I want to, this is a 30-year shingle. I'm going to use my 30-year shingle macro. And it's got every line. It's got the ridge, ridge if you can pay for it or not, which depends on the carrier right. sometimes. The shingles tear off. The shingles replace with waste. The felt, you know, drip edge. Maybe there's, you know, ice and water shield in your macro. Vent, vent caps, um, steep and high charges, you know. Ham valley metal stuff like that right and so that's all in your macro and then you've when after you finish scope in the house you know you look at your scope sheet and you're like all right there's no valleys on this there's no it's not steep and it's not high it's not this it's not that you just go there and remove the items you don't need yeah so you can control click and you're just like i don't want these six line items delete takes them out of your estimate and then you and then you just put the numbers in you know there's 14 metal turtle vents you change the number from one or whatever you had in there to 14 yep. and then you're done and it takes it's just like seconds and you, you got a rough estimate you're not like trying to remember what everything every line item that goes into a rough estimate which macros i mean there's it's I, and i agree i think they're the number one speed sure. thing and not everybody uses them and i find that amazing that don't, people don't use them yeah the other thing so this of course you know i'm writing in two different softwares i'm writing in some ability and i'm writing in and Xactimate, but when I'm using Xactimate, so here's a, here's another hack. There's two hacks in one. Get Xactimate mobile. Learn how to use, get you an iPhone 12 or better, okay? Learn how to use LiDAR or augmented reality. Do your measurements that way because now what I do is I walk into a room. I have a, I, I literally walk into a water loss claim. I don't even have a notepad with me, Okay. I walk in, I make my notes, I, I open up my notes file, hit the button, do my voice notes as I'm walking through, looking at everything, flip over my Xactimate, I've got the file open, and I start taking my measurements, measure, drop the windows in, drop the doors, everything else. It's done, okay? Upload it, okay? Uh, move my, move my uh, photos over to it, upload it. Now I get back out to the car, 
you know, if I'm doing it on site and uh, I clean it up, whatever I have to clean up on it and I'm done, you know, run my macro, I'm done. And, and that speeds things up versus going in there, measuring the entire room, putting it on your piece of paper and then going back out to the car and sketching it. Okay. I've eliminated a process yeah. there. And the other great thing about You've it eliminated is two processes, right. sketching and measuring, right? Sketching and measuring. I've eliminated those. I've eliminated measuring. I eliminate sketching on a piece of paper and I've eliminated sketching three and, and, in, uh, in sketch and sketch. And so I've, I've now picked up another claim for the day oh, about, for by sure. learning how to do that. That, that has been my biggest time saver, you know, next to yeah. macros. The other thing is, is that say I'm writing in stability. Okay. Uh, stability doesn't have that feature. I have a dummy claim. Okay. I have a dummy claim set up in Xactimate Mobile that I will walk into a room and I will go ahead and do everything in that room on Xactimate Mobile. So this way, whenever I get to Sembility, I can just open it up and all my measurements and everything are there and I draw the room, but all my measurements are there. Okay, I've saved time again. I still have to get into Sembility. I still have to sketch in Sembility, but I'm not running around with a notepad and a piece of paper, you know, drawing things out and then basically doing it twice. And so that's my little, that's my little hack that I do. Did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. Yeah, so, and, and as far as like a, like a, a a dummy estimate, like you're talking about, put you know, t taking one and putting it into stability. So right. something you can do the same thing in Xactimate. I have template estimates like a smoker. It's got all the rooms and everything, and you can just you can do a copy from project, or you can copy and paste all mm -hmm. those all those folders over. You know, and if if you can imagine the the grouping tree in Xactimate, and then you put your measurements in, and you delete the things you don't want in there, and maybe there's an extra thing that you need but that saves like on a bit like a large water losses there's no reason why estimating a large water loss should take very long right even a, a big big one you know i mean i've i've knocked out um i mean i had one where people came home from vacation and water line had broken and hardwood floors were just just yeah. cupped and and everything is horribly and uh, whole house has to be, I mean, everything's got to be replaced. There's, of course, flood cuts, everything else. I think I knocked the whole thing out from, from scope to finish. I was a little over an hour yeah. on that one because macros. Macros. And templates. For sure. uh, so those are the, those. so number one, macros. Number two is learn how to use the technology that is there. You have access to it. Yeah. You know, using Xactimate Mobile, using that LiDAR. Okay, so you, you love your Android phone. I get it. You know, Android's cool. That's the hip thing to have. I, I understand. I get it, man. But I'm sorry. If I can knock out an extra five to seven claims a week, and my minimum, and the minimum you make is 250, you know, 225, 250 bucks a claim, uh, you just paid for your iPhone, bro. Yeah. Okay. You know, you just, you just, you just covered it. And, and you know what? You can use an iPhone or iPad too if you want to. Can use an iPad. That's what I have here. Yeah. And uh, the Pros. iPad Pro. Um, it's more 
it's bigger and it's not like in your pocket. It's bulky. Just, but. And <coughs> excuse me. So those are those are my speed tips. And then finally, let's say that you know for whatever reason I can't ride them in the field. I've got to just scope and 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 ride back at the apartment or you know hotel or whatever the house i don't stress myself out i want to i want to ride everything i can the same day i mean that's that's what i want to do but i also know that my most productive time i wake up early i'm an early oh old guys wake up early you know and uh and that's because we wake up and we go oh it's time to get up oh no it's time for coffee and then you're like yeah (laughs) yeah coffee (laughs) so uh i I'm very productive first thing in the morning. I'm a morning person, yeah. you know, and if I have no distractions, nobody around me, I can, I can sit down and bust out six, seven claims from six o'clock until like ten or eleven. I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, and that's not even, and that's not even just sticking my head in it, ignoring. It. I mean, I'm getting up and making coffee, you know. Um, I might throw a shower in in the middle of it, you know, yeah, but rather than waiting to the end of the show. It, it's but I'm productive that way because I have no distractions. Yes. And then, um, so when you know, when you know when your product, product, your most productive times are, take advantage of that. When you know, when you have that opportunity, don't sit there and go, "Oh man, I'm going to be working on these claims until midnight tonight." My experience is, for me, the longer I work, the longer my day is, the less productive I am. Okay. And I'm going to sit there and drag those claims out and I'm probably not going to finish them. You know, Yeah. I'm probably not going to get them done. So, so there's no sense in me spending all that time, wasting my time doing it, freaking myself out over it. I'll schedule, you know, if I know that I'm going to have those type of days, I plan in advance, you know, Monday, I'm going to scope six, seven claims that day, you know, and I'm going to get up the next morning. I'm going to write them. Now what that does is I'm done before noon, okay? If I want to grab some claims off the end of my schedule, okay, and move them up and try to knock out one or two that afternoon and, you know, go scope them and ride them the same day, now I've, guess what I did? I went from seven now to nine in two days. You know, that's still good productivity. Oh, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Might even knock out three that day, which means I did 10 in two days, okay? And I wasn't freaking out by trying to scope and write you know, 10 or five in a day, even though I end up writing, I mean, it's just, it's weird how the productivity happens yeah. when you do it that when you break it out and, and then I'll turn around on Wednesday and I'll scope, you know, five to seven claims or write them on Thursday, Friday, five to seven claims to write them on Saturday morning, be done with it early. And then I'm going to play the rest of the weekend. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to play the rest of the weekend. I'm going to go fishing on Sunday. You know, I'm going to go play golf. You know, yeah. I'm going to, you know, play with the dog all day, whatever, you know, I, but that's why I'm doing it. And I'm, and so now I'm doing my goal, my goal running dailies. I want to do f- minimum 15 a week, minimum 15. Yeah. My it's comfort, good. you know, I 18 is really my goal. That's my, that's my real goal per week is 18 a week. Um, running a schedule like that. I'm doing 21, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing that easy in a week. So, um, even if you're on a cat, I'm telling you right now, if you're on a cat and you're knocking out 18 to 21 a week, you're making money. Okay. Even if you're just minimum billers, you're still making money and you're a producer and they're happy with you, you know, cause you're, you're knocking those out. So just take advantage of your, of the technology you have, the, and then your product, when you know your productive times are, yeah. take advantage of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think that this kind of, this, this sort of a thing definitely is, um, you know, when we talk about productivity and we talk about producing, you know, the, the number, total number of closed claims that you do in a year, this is, this is how you do it. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, t- T- talking about macros, talking about you know using Xactimate Mobile, which I think is amazing, um, and having you know template estimates and and s- thinking ahead a couple of steps and saying you know what, well I can still sort of use this technology in Symbility, even though it's not you know I can still there's a way I can do it right, which I think is you know you're smart. I mean it's 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 that kind of thinking that helps you to do well, right? Um, having knowing when you're most productive. I'm the same way and I don't want to work at night. 
I don't want to. I don't want to do it at all. It's just, I'd rather just eat dinner and go to bed. That's the way I am. Watch TV, you know, for 20 minutes. Watch YouTube or read a book or something. Um, <clears throat> so I built my schedule and the way I worked so that I wouldn't have to. And that's why I would always close claims on site. Um, and it's, you know, nobody does it. I don't know why. But it's one of those things that I, I believe made me faster and made me, my, my estimates were more accurate because I'd meet with the contractor and he'd, like, he'd be like, all right, well, I guess, you know, you know, here's my card. Call me when you, I'm like, I'm writing this up right now. Oh, you are? Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just take, I'll go talk to the insurer. I'll show them colors and, you know, shingles. Right. And, and then we get an agreed scope pricing right there. That claim's done. I mean, it's just, right. and it doesn't take, you know, p- people think, the, the sensible thing, the, the logical thing is that, hey, during the day, the sun's up, um, I can maximize my time by scoping only, right? Going out and taking photos and doing, you know, scoping two, maybe three an hour, you know, hail claims if they're all close to each other. All right. Um, you can do that, right? Um, I can write, like I can scope and write a full, complete hail claim, roof gutters, you know, tool elevations, siding, window wrap, screens, some fence, deck stain, one water spot on the ceiling, grill cover. I can do that in 45 to 55 minutes. I got, I got it down right. by shaving seconds off here, seconds off there, minutes off here, minutes off there. Super tight routing, you know, doing some claims recon beforehand where I say, all right, I'm looking at my loss report and this house it has a coverage A limit of $125,000. Probably going to be a one-story ranch with, you know, gable with no offsets or anything. 90% of the time that's what it is. You know, look at my next one. My next one is Six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I'm going to Google Earth or Google Maps, Street, and whatever. You know, I'm looking at the satellite image of that house to see is it sitting on five acres with a bunch of fence and a bunch of outbuildings. And that one might take me more than fifty-five minutes, right? Because right. it's just walking to the outbuilding in the back of the yard, looking at the fence and all that stuff, right? So I'll I'll recon things. So maybe I hit that one at the end of the day. So it doesn't matter if if it goes long, because it's just pushing into my dinner time. Um, or do, you know, there are a whole bunch of different ways of doing things, you know, depending on which way, you know, where you are in the city, where the claims are, you know, which way you drive in to your claims, right? Or where you're going to get your hotel in relation to which way rush hour is going in the morning or in the evening, right? So you, that makes a, a massive, right. that can be at two hours a day, right? You go in the opposite direction to rush hour whenever you have to get on the highway or the main roads. Um, getting up early, if I have to do corrections, um, Corrections are first thing in the morning yeah, before right I leave. For, you can't call people at 4 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock, really even 7.30, so, yeah. 8 o'clock. You know, always eight after, after 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. So, and then I'm not calling people after 9 p.m., the latest for right. me. And it's usually no later than 8 p.m. So you do all the stuff that you don't need to have. You're not, your phone's not going to be ringing at that time either. So you're not going to be distracted by you know, phones ringing and, and you're getting text messages or emails. Nobody's up. This is you, you know, a pot of coffee and just hammering down on this stuff, right? Nothing new is happening that you're going to distract you on the TV or on the YouTube or whatever. Get that work done. And then later in the day, I have a time block that I use to check voicemail and call people, right? This is a little bit controversial depending on who you, who you ask, but I used my voicemail as an assistant if I didn't have an assistant, if I wasn't using an assistant. It, if I'm doing inspections, if I'm writing estimates, if I'm not in a time block and I, blo- I, you know, I have like specific t- blocks where I'm doing mm-hmm. only this one thing. If I'm not in the block where I'm having to touch my phone for any reason, I'm not answering it. I don't care who's calling. Unless it's my manager calls me three times in a row or texts me, hey man, call me back. Then I'm going to call that guy. There's nothing, there's no emergency that's, that's, you know, hot file. You can wait two and a half hours until I get to my, my phone time block and I'll call you back. Sorry, it's just the way it is. So I'm able to be at somebody's house, scope the, the damage, write, you know, draw my diagrams and write the estimate and everything without being distracted by phones ringing and then I got to pull that guy's file up, sit there for 20 minutes with him on the phone. That just added 20 minutes to my 45 minute. So now I'm over an hour. It's a total waste of time. Um, so 
usually around lunchtime, I will go get some tacos or, you know, if I brown bagged it or whatever, and then speakerphone and, and with a pad of paper in the truck and I'm listening to my voicemail. I don't need to call that person back because they, they, they called me back and they said, which is, it would be a 15 minute phone call that would waste, you know, or five minute phone yep. call that would waste 15, 15 minutes for a million reasons. You know, Jenny Smith called and she just wanted to say, hey, I got your voicemail about coming out at 1 p.m. on Thursday. It sounds great. We'll see you then. No need to call me back. I'm not calling that person back. And if I had to call or she, if I had picked up when she told, called me, she, we might have like gotten talking about something and like ended up being longer than a, a 13 second voicemail. Right. I'll g- do all my, my voicemails. I will anything that any other phone calls I needed to make will be listed out here. And then I'm going to call people, everybody back who needs to be called back and then put the phone away phone. Just, I'm not using the phone anymore because the next step after that, this is in my like, little admin, you know, hour, 90 minute, maybe over lunch-ish time block, I'm going to get into Xactimate and I'm going to update all the activity diaries of everybody that I just talked to, you know. So Jenny Smith confirmed 1 p.m. Thursday. Bing. You know, it's in there. It's one little, and it pops up in in exact analysis. My manager sees that and he can sleep at night because he's not worried about, you know, I'm not seeing any notes in any of your files. And I've had that call. I've gotten, I've gotten that call before. Get all this put into Xactimate close the exact mate and they start i go start doing more inspections you know wipe the hot sauce off my face and go back to work right and by the end of the day you know and i would do you know you get up at 4 30 or 5 or 4 or whatever and i'm on my first first roof at nine you know or maybe eight and then i've done four three to four in the morning take my little hour long lunch which is not really a, a break because i'm still working i'm doing phone work and then I do until six or seven, I do another three or four, right? So that's six to eight, you know? And if I'm, if, if there's the $125,000 houses, I can do, you can do those in 35 minutes. You can scope and write that sucker in 35 minutes, and no joke. Import label photos, settle with the insured, 35 minutes. I did it for decades, so all summer long. Are you, where are you getting your roof sketches? Are you sketching your roofs? Straight gable, yeah. It's okay. too. It's it's. You draw a no, box. No, I'm talking about when you're doing other houses and stuff. I mean, you're. I, you have a cut up. You know. I never bought Eagle Views. Sometimes they give them to you, but and I would waste time on those bigger ones doing that. Okay. If I if I bought Eagle Views on the 55 square, you know, it's 14s on the side and 11 right. 12s on the front, and there's hips and. I mean, I I've spent two hours doing that for sure. Yeah, so, and that's why I would triage those on their own day. So, what one of the things that I'll I'll do is um, I get sketches. I mean, I, I just I order sketches ahead of time. Yeah, you know, I mean, if I get on a roof, I have to sketch it. Yeah, all right. It, for the sake of efficiency and getting that, so, so a lot of the areas that I've had to cover, as I have to cover some miles. So there's days where I'm sure. Yeah. So if if I'm trying to knock out five to seven scopes in a day, but yet I'm having to drive 200 miles to do it, 200 yeah. plus miles to do it. You know, I'm some days like that. I can't ride on site. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm on the road. I got miles. And so, so I'm going to order my sketches ahead of time. Okay. There are companies out there that do sketches for 20 bucks, yeah. you know, and they're accurate and they're good, you know? Um, and if for some reason they can't get you, get it for you. Well, you know, there's always hover. You know, yeah. um, might be a little more expensive when you get on site, but anything that I can do to save me money. Yes. I may have to spend extra money on a hover. Okay. For one out of every 25, 30 claims. Okay. But for the sake of efficiency, okay. I'm going to spend it. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to worry about, I'm not going to worry about, a, you know, an extra 20, 30 bucks, whatever it is, whatever it's going to save me time. And it's all about saving time. Time is a resource that we can never replace. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's true. We we cannot replace that. Once it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. I can't create more of it. Okay. But what I can do is I can be more efficient with it. And the more efficient I am with my time, the more work I can get done in a shorter period of time. And the more James gets to play. Because exactly. James likes to play. Or sleep. But uh, or, I don't sleep that much. It's overrated. Uh, and listen, if you go to bed at eight thirty or nine o'clock every night, you're automatically gonna get up at four o'clock in the morning. Because right. that's just you know, you're not gonna get twelve hours of sleep so, sleep until ten or with those with those roof sketches, once they're done, okay, um, 
and I know that what I've been seeing in that area, because I've been in that area before, I may go ahead and write the claim. Oh, yeah. No, I've thought I may go ahead and just drop in my macro, you know, and this way all I've got to do is go delete stuff, put my yep. photos in, yep. and that's it. And See, you talk- this is a this is the mindset right here, man. And I, and I I wasn't being totally accurate before. I have absolutely ordered eagles, right. a lot of eagle views. I try not to, right? Um, but that's the kind of mindset that you got to have. And really, what it boils down to is is that whenever you have your hands on the claim, you're doing as much as you can in the claim yep. while you're in it. Let me check in every little box and. She, everything making sure the diary is up to date if you like you said and i've, I've totally done that drop a macro in there yep. if it's if you're like man i know every single roof from that that whole neighborhood is smashed yep. I'm, I'm gonna drop my macro in or if i see it's a simple let's say i look at it first you know and i see it's a simple gable roof i'll just go ahead and draw it you know drop in the macro change the measurements whenever i'm done you know and change my you know vents and whatever else i need to change and I can close that on site, inspect, close, done. Yeah. Okay. Thirty minutes on site, you know, and gone. There's no and reason. I, I don't see any reason for the kind of claims we're talking about. We're not saying like hurricane claims or right. like you know wildfire or stuff like this. this. Is like these are my average daily claims that I'm running. Right. You know, garden variety hail claims in the vast majority of neighborhoods in the U.S. Where, that it were to middle America. Right. I mean, they're not super expensive houses. Most of them are not two-story. Most of them are straight gable or a little small hip, maybe with an offset or two on it. Those are with, with macros, roof macro, fascia macro, gutter macro, siding macro, your window wraps macro, um, the water spot macro. How long did it takes as long as it took me to say those things to put them into the estimate right. and then another minute or two to go through and tweak and you know put the measurements in and everything why in the world would anybody spend more than on it this I mean, I'm garden variety hail claims nothing wild and crazy right you know why would you spend any more time than 10 max 10 minutes and labeling photos so for me I am not a keyboardist at all. I am not fast with a keyboard. This is where it gets super controversial because I say, I don't know why it takes people so long to, because I type fast and maybe that's. I, and I'm not a fast typer. I never have been, you know, but there's this thing called voice to text. <laughs> right. Okay. The most accurate voice to text program that there is, the most accurate one there is, Siri. Yeah. When I'm labeling photos, I've got one. That's, there's one that's built into to Windows. It's already in there. Okay. Hit, uh, hit Windows and then H. It will bring it up for you. Okay. You put your cursor in a. You put your cursor in a, in a text box. And, click, say something. You know, say what you're gonna say. It pops it in there, but it's not real accurate. Okay. Um, I guess it doesn't like my Texas accent sometimes. I'm not sure. Or I mumble. I don't know, but it, it it gets some really weird stuff in there. But if if I've already if I've got my photos, that's the other thing is I take my photos in the mobile app. Of the mm-hmm. pro- there's a there's a little microphone thing in there, isn't it? For right, and so you hit that and you label it, take a picture, label it, and I'm and I'm doing that as I'm going through. Um, I do that on most claims, not all claims. It depends on if I'm trying to get away from the person or not. You know, <laughs> he, we all have those. Now I've written a full claim. With my phone and stability. That's a whole other story, a whole other topic. Okay. My iPad, okay, I've gone in, taken my photos, and written the whole claim on my iPad right there on the spot because it was a simple water loss, one room. You know, that's it. I mean, I'm out. It's that, it's that easy. You have assemblies that are built up, you know, easy to do. But, uh, but these little things that save you time, I, I'll be honest with you. I'll be perfectly honest. I have a great work ethic. I'll brag about that all day long. I have my managers back me up with my work ethic, but I'm lazy. Okay, yeah. I'm lazy. I want to find the easiest way to do it, to close that claim and be done with it. Hey, Matt, kudos to you, man, that you can close seven to ten claims a day, seven days a week. That ain't me, bro. I'm not doing that. I'm gonna. I have my number that I'm happy with, you know, and I'll do it. And I'm producing, and I'm still closing more claims than the average guy. You know, and that's what I'm doing. That's that's what works for me. Okay. Yeah. No. Listen, I'm, 
You know, one hundred percent. I'm, I'm, I'm killing it. You know, I'm killing it. I'm having a, you know, every time I go somewhere. But that's me. I, I have my pace. I want to work. I have my, I have in my head. This is how many claims I'm going to look at this week, or how many I'm going to look at today, and, and that's what I stick with. And however, it, whatever it takes for me to get that done, I'm going to do it in the most efficient way possible. Whether that be, okay, this day they're all close together. I can all ride them on site. This day. They're spread out everywhere. I'm going to have just enough time to get everything scoped today. Yeah. Okay. And be back at a reasonable hour. So I'm not going to schedule anything tomorrow and I'm just going to write claims tomorrow. Yeah. You know, whatever it takes to, for me to be the most efficient and not stress myself out while at the same time still hitting my personal production numbers that I set for myself, that's what I'm going to do. And if I can squeeze something in here and there, yeah, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to kill myself over it. Yeah. That's the, again, that's me you know, and how I work it. I, I totally agree. And that it's the reason why I do what I do because I also am lazy. Yeah. I don't, I, but I have like 20 years of doing it and right. muscle memory out the wazoo. So right. I've built stream streamlined processes to such a degree that I can, you know, six was my minimum right. on a hail storm. I'm not talking about dailies. You don't, get a, you don't even need to get assigned enough to do six a day every single day of the week no, on no, dailies. Week, no. so but on a hailstorm usually you're you're um they've got you into like one or two zip codes right a couple of neighborhoods right and they, they do that on purpose they put all right matt's going to get this quadrant and it's a bunch of houses and they're all it's like two or three different neighborhoods next to each other all right if you're able to like finish this house to turn it on and drive 100 feet to your next loss you have like a 10 second drive. Have I time. ever got that? Oh, yeah. Listen, yeah, you can. You so know, listen. But I have, I have not gotten that yet. Because so. of what you've been telling me, you are the guy that will be able to do yeah. seven to nine a day on a hailstorm in a, in a neighborhood where everybody's house is worth $160,000. Mm-hmm. And they're all, you know, either no siding, like they're all brick, like some places everybody's got brick, or it's aluminum, it's old. Right. And you've got, and it's, it's just, they're rectangles. You're, it's right. you're drawing a rectangle, right? Two measurements. How high is it? Well, it's nine and a half feet from the ground to the to the bottom of the soffit, and it's fifty five feet across. Right. It doesn't take all day to do that. It's just, right. I mean, it's and and then you you look at the roof and you say, all right, well, it's a foot out on the, the eaves are a foot out. I now have the roof half the roof measurement. It's fifty seven feet long. Yep. I'm I'm already drawing that stuff, and, and so that's why. And anybody who's been doing this, like, has done a lot of cat property. Knows you have to, to do that. No, right. because the, and the, you're the person that produces, you're going to get more claims. You get more claims, you get more money. You're on a storm longer, especially if you can keep your quality up. There's guys that will bang cl- claims out. They'll do 12, 15 a day, and they're, they're the worst claims ever. They'll either deny everything or they'll buy everything, and they're sloppy and they're terrible. And somehow those guys work. I don't know how. And they're, they're the guys that are giving us a bad reputation, right? Yeah. Got to have high quality, as high a quality as you can. We talk about it. But you got to be fast yep. and friendly. Yep. Fast, friendly, and what was the third one? F- good. Good. So, and, and again, I, I have those days where, you know, let's use Albuquerque as an example. There's a little area called Rio Rancho, it's a suburb north of there, that it got hit with a hailstorm earlier this year. And there's one neighborhood that these houses are all small houses. I've done, you know, seven, eight in that neighborhood in a day, yeah. you know, because they're all right there. But yeah. I haven't had the luxury of all my stuff close together. You will, you know. So one of these days, summer. one of these days, I'll, I'll get a hailstorm. They're gonna send you, you know? to Abilene, a little town, yeah, I know and you're gonna know. go. Yeah. Our Abilene, Kansas. I, I spent a summer in Abilene, Kansas. Beautiful, wonderful, little quiet, just right off the interstate. The, 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 it was a square, and at the end of these, the, square, the, the city, the town streets, there's cornfields in every direction for, for as far as you could see. And there was no contractors because the contractors didn't want to get too small of a town, yep. wouldn't have worked there. And I was, every day it was just like, and they were, they had monster hail. You're going to get that storm and you're going to be like, oh, I see what Matt's talking about now. Yeah. I can do that. And I can still go to bed at 845, get up at four if I have to, which you probably won't have to. You just get up and watch TV in the morning. The other thing is, is give windows of time and don't give exact times when you schedule. Yeah. yeah. I And I overlap all my times, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I take into consideration drive time, everything else, but I overlap everything this way. If I'm done sooner, 
I can get there quicker. Yeah. You know, you start to get ahead and you're scheduling it. And it can go the other way. You can get behind. And too. I can get behind too. And I just have to make a phone call. Hey, you know, yeah. I'd want to screw me up. I'll, I'll get there as fast as I can. Um, but whenever I have those days and everything clicks, it's just like go to one, bam, that was easy. Bam, that's easy. Bam, that's easy. I can be done. I can be done by two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, and everything written, everything done. All my claims knocked out before noon, you know, finished writing by two. It sounds like you could probably do more a day. James. I probably could, but you can't always guarantee that all those claims are going to go that way. And that's right. the problem, yeah. you know? And so I bake in the oh crap factor into it that something's going to go wrong or the claim is going to be a little bit more complicated. You know, I just don't, I always have a point in my life. I just don't want unnecessary stress. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> you know, some of the, the least stressful times in my entire life have been when I've been on cat. Right. Just cause I know I'm making money. The claims are all easy. Everybody's super nice. Cause I'm in, you know, junction city, Kansas. And it's just like salt of the earth and no contractors around or the contractors that are there are all super cool. And everything will work from total in it. That is like, there's zero anxiety, zero stress. It's just, you're just making money yep. every time the fat. And if this is where you start to like, you write down time when you, I, I start writing my, my, uh, I start the inspection at, you know, 10 58, right? I finished my inspection at 11 21 or whatever. And I write that down and I'm like, and so as I'm going along, I'm tracking like how many minutes it takes me to do each thing. And I'm trying to figure out ways to make each, each you, you track it. Right. Yep. Um, as far as like the scheduling goes, I would, I wouldn't exactly overlap, but my first appointment is a hard, like it's on the hour. Right. Every appointment's on the hour. So I wouldn't, like if I, if I know I can do it in 30 minutes, I'm not doing 30, like I'll see you at 9.30. I'm not doing that. It's 8 a.m., right? Or 9 a.m., depends. And the shoulder seasons, if you're not in the middle of like, if it's not the summer solstice when the, right. the, the days are super long, if the sun's low in the sky, one side of the roof can be covered in dew and you're not going to be able to see anything anyway. Right. So you got to wait till it gets up a little bit. So 8 a.m., 9 a.m., whatever. 8 a.m. is my first appointment. My next appointment will be from 9 to 10. And when I make these, you know, these appointments, and the next one will be from 10 to 11. That's why I make mine. And 11 to 12. And then after that, it'll be uh, 1 to 3, 2 to 4, and then that, that'd be my... But I, when I tell people, I say, I'll be to your house sometime between... 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. I'm going to try to get there right at 9, but, you know, because I'm, I'm doing, looking at a lot of these, you know, during the day that, or I might hit traffic or whatever. So one of my appointments might go long. It might be after that, but just, you know, if I, if I'm not there right at nine o'clock on the dot, there's a baby. It's a baby. Um, don't fret. And, <coughs> and if I'm not going to be there, if I, even if I told them from two to four, if I'm not going to be there right at two o'clock and I know it like at 11 o'clock in the morning or 10 or whatever, I know it that some, we just totally went sideways. I'm calling that person and I'm going to say, Hey, you know, I don't, I said I'd be there between two and four o'clock and I, I told you I was going to try to be there right at two. I might be a little bit after that. Right. So I'm just, just trying to keep, and people, it doesn't matter what you say. If you, if you call and you let them know that you're thinking about their time and like, you know, you're trying to, not be like just on island time or like mm -hmm. the cable guy time. Right. You're thinking about their time before your time and you just keep them, just keep them updated at exactly, exactly when you think you're going to show up. You know, it's really only one call that you got to make throughout the day. To, and it, you may not even make that call every single day. Right. You may just be showing up right when you say, you say you're going to people, they say, thank you. 100%. Even the saltiest, you know, the crankiest, grumpiest old dude or woman or whoever, you know what? Thank you so much for calling and letting me know. Yep. Thank you. Yep. I'm going to be 15 minutes behind schedule. Even if I know I'm only going to be four minutes behind schedule, I'm like, I'll give them all under promise and over deliver on it. And they love that even more. Oh, wow. And then you have that one person says, well, I need a very exact and specific time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my contractor is going to be here. And so yeah. I, I need an exact time. You're going to be here. Give me his number. You know? And, uh, I was like, well, you know, or the person go, I'm a very busy person. You have to give me an exact time. Listen, said, on a Midwest hailstorm, you don't get a whole lot of that. When you're yeah. in the on the coast, right. you know, you're in a big, big city. Yeah, big cities. Everybody's, everybody's important. Or 
big big claims like big right. water losses and stuff but yeah of course i'll tell them well Are those and all of those for for me for doing dailies and water losses it's a hard appointment there's no yeah. overlap there's no window i'll be there at two o'clock period i'll just tell them i'm i'm booked out for the next 12 days so if you need an exact time it'll be 8 a.m on this day well 8 a.m doesn't work for me how about four in the afternoon nope 8 a.m. It's only it's already booked. Uh, those are the only those are the only hard times I can give are 8 a.m. and it's amazing. How, okay, I can be okay. available on that day between nine and ten. And you know what? You, you mentioned like using Xactimate Mobile and like the Sketch AR thing to yeah. be super fast on those losses. Like if I have a, a like a really really big water loss, the way I was doing it, this was before like that was Sketch AR was any good. Um, I would take my laptop in. Where is it? I have a laptop, a laptop stand around here somewhere. And I would go into the room, take photos, take measurements, and write it up as I go. And I put the photos in mm -hmm. as I'm going. So that when I, at the end of the, when I get back to the front of the house, it's done. But it would still take me three hours to do that. If it was like a 5,000 square foot house all on one level with cabinets and everything, you know. But with that Sketch AR thing and the way you're talking about doing it's it. It's so fast. Oh, my gosh. It's so yeah, incredible. I... I if you told me I had to go sketch a house tomorrow, I'd cry. <laughs> if he took my phone away from me and said, you, you can't use your phone, you got to sketch. I'm like, no. <laughs> Where's the Matterport? Right. <laughs> so I had this one. Talk about doing a bunch of claims in a day. And I, I, I think I've, I've told this story already on, on his YouTube channel, but I think it was like four years ago. So we're going to, for those of you who aren't going to dig that far back into the archives, I had... A, it wasn't just one. It was 36. Um, I wrote, I remember, scoped. I remember. Yeah, I scoped, uh, wrote up and closed, and settled 36 claims in one day. 36 individual claims. There was a commercial loss and uh, was with one property manager. And it was in uh, Saint, like the suburbs, like the St. Charles, St. Peter's, whatever, suburbs of St. Louis. Um, this guy had started um, building rental properties, these little like two bedroom rental properties, little tiny right. little houses. Um, and they were like a 212 roof pitch and they were all identical, right? And they all were brick, no window wraps, no metal cladding, no paint to chip, no gutters and no damage to the fascia. I can't remember what the fascia looked like, but I didn't write it. It was roofs only. And every single roof was exactly the same. And I met the guy out there at six o'clock in the morning and they were hammered and it was a th real thin three tab. And so they was, they, you walk around on them and he caused damage. Uh, met the property manager out there on the first one. And we looked at the first two or three or four together. And he's like, he's like, yeah, it seems like these are going to be kind of a, you know, pretty easy for you. It looks like you're paying for them. And I'm, and I'm like, if they all look like this, they're all getting paid for. He's like, oh, I got stuff to do. So just give me a call when you get done and we'll go from there. I was like, all right scoped them and then went and sat down at an Arby's and wrote them up and called him and said, Hey, I'm down at the Arby's down to whatever street. And, uh, I got these all written up for you. And again, like we said, with commercial claims, they may all be under one like blanket policy, but they're, they get assigned out to you as individual claims. So they have their own claim number and you get to bill for each one. I copy and paste it. I've carried my ladder from house to house, I walked down the street, 36 of them, and they were all right next to each other. And copy and pasted my, I just wrote, drew, drew one roof sketch. It was like a straight gable with one little offset, 212. And I double checked the measurements on all of them just in case it wasn't like a w one weird one, all exactly the same. Took all my pictures, did all my test squares, took pictures of that stuff, and then walked down to the next one, walked down to the next one, just did that. And I was, I was done doing that by noon, you know? maybe not even and then wrote him up three o'clock in the afternoon called that guy came down and i said these are all exactly the same i couldn't find one that had anything different and none of them had fence there's no fence and if there was it was like chain link right no trees no nothing and uh i said this is how much they are individually here's the grand total of all of them matted up you know and then the deductible which you only apply one deductible to like a big right. commercial group like that the deductible, the first check is going to be this. It's a replacement cost policy. You know, the second check, once, once you guys start doing the work, will be this. If you 
contractor comes out, finds more damage, da 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 da, give me a call. Otherwise, you know, and I printed them all out and then handed them to them. I had to go buy more printer, printer ink, but um, 36 in a day. They were little 36. tiny claims. I mean, they were like 3,600 bucks a piece. It's like the, not the billing, but like the, the total estimate because there was like 12 square roofs. With I mean, they were super small little houses. Um, but that's how I did 36 claims in one day. <coughs> what do you think about that, James? That wasn't even the whole day. You're a god amongst men. I, well, you know, I get that. So I had this one. So it was, um, it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> ah, good old Santa yeah, Fe. Yeah, Santa Fe. You know, every time I get a claim in Santa Fe, I, for some reason I'm driving up the highway going, Do you know the way to Santa Fe? I've never heard that song. That's Do You Know the Way to San Jose by Dion Warwick from back oh. in the 70s. It's <laughs> got to be kind of old. Anyway, um, this was my first um, membrane TPO PVC roof. It was my first one. Um, the guy who, uh, um, the, the family owned the house, um, the wife was a retired admiral from the Navy, and the husband was a former... I'm not going to say who he did it for, but he was a former campaign manager for a presidential candidate. Oh. And, um, and he said that they came to, they came to Santa Fe because they were living in D.C. And they said because of the political climate was deteriorated so much in D.C., they just no longer wanted a front row seat. <laughs> and, uh, I got, understand that. And so moved to Santa Fe. And uh, so, so the husband's there. Was it Donald Rumsfeld? No. He wasn't. No. A, no. So, uh, anyway, this, um, I get there and I meet the guy. He's a pretty cool dude, you know. He's he's wearing a, you know, just average Joe guy, you know. Just, you, you would, this big, gigantic, you know, adobe house in Santa Fe. I mean, you walk inside, I'm like going, how am I going to sketch this? <laughs> I mean, it's just like r rounded walls. It's, you know, it's perlite, you know. Um, like plaster, you know, it, it's just like, I'm like, oh my God, this is going to suck. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm, I'm like, I'm just, this is beyond my skill set. You know, you go in the bedroom, there's water damage in there. I just got to figure it out, you know, so I'm, I'm measuring everything, you know. This was before I became a pro with, with a, a the exactly lighter, with lighter, yeah. So I, I get all that done and then I get up on the roof. I checked that out, you know, of course, ordered a roof sketch on it. It's huge. Cut up. I mean, for an Adobe roof, I mean, it's flat roof. It's got, you know, all these different sections and everything else. And I'm like, man, I'll be here forever, you know. So uh, so I'm talking to the guy, and there's still, I mean, it's still wet. I mean, it's it's been like this for a while. And I'm like, and you could, like, I walked into a closet. You could smell, you know, the mildew and everything starting. And... um so I said, have you had anybody come out and try to dry this out, mitigation come out? No, why would we do that? You know, I'm like, well, because you, know, you have a responsibility to stop the damage from getting worse, you know, and, and if it rains again, it's going to get worse. And uh, so I said, here's what I'm going to do is I said, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get all this written up. In the meantime, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, suggest, you know, call the desk adjuster and tell them that you need mitigation. We need mitigation on this. Well, okay. You know, fine. Okay. You know, so I called it, try to reach out to the desk adjuster. Couldn't get over some note. Next morning, I get a phone call. It's the guy's wife. So she's a former admiral, but she's also an attorney. Okay. Um, Mr. Mathis, this is, so, so I said, yes, ma'am. She says, um, I just want to know why you're suggesting this for litigation. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> she is fit to be tied. Oh, my God. You know, you told my husband that you're going to set this up for, for litigation. That you're going to contact the litigation team. And, and oh uh, if you think for one minute we did 
committed fraud on this or whatever. She goes, you are highly mistaken. Stewed over that all night. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't say litigation. I said mitigation. And uh, she goes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> she says, was my husband wearing his hearing aids? <laughs> I said, I didn't notice. But I did notice that sometimes we were talking and just like staring into outer space. Yeah. <laughs> she goes, yeah, he probably wouldn't wear his hearing. I'm so sorry. It's, it's good. So but she Holy was smokes. fit to be tied. And, and you're right. She said that whenever she spoke to him, that she was, she, she was out of town. She was flying in, got in late, and they were having conversation about it, you know, over late night wine. And uh, she says, I didn't sleep all night. I'm going, what do they mean? Litigation. <laughs> oh, that would freak, would freak me out if I thought if somebody came in my house. Yeah, you know, our adjuster said they're going to litigate against us. Well, listen, and I, I've had people tell me this before, that homeowners can be, like, scared of us. Because a lot of people, even on, like, the most obvious cut and dry, like, the hail did it, or the right. tree did it, or the water came. They're, like, they're, they're afraid you're going to think that you're, like, looking for fraud that they're going to th you're yeah. going to think that they are they committed fraud yeah. a lot of people think that and that's one of the, the things that you have to like it's part of the bedside manner thing is to help them see you know listen you're not and you're not going to say i'm not looking for fraud or anything no. you're just acting in such a way that you're not the kind of person that would look for fraud or this because the thing about it is you know not to go off and you know the rails on the fraud conversation but it's super duper obvious when somebody oh, commits yeah. fraud. It's yeah. the, the, people think they're being clever, and it's like, okay, I'm taking a bunch of pictures of that, and it's going to SIU. You know, somebody will call you. Thanks for you know. So I only had one this year that was a that was a fraud claim, and it. it I, I truly believe that the guy didn't know anything about it. He was a disabled vet, and you got up on the roof, and it's just it's obvious what we're looking at. Yeah. And the second you get up there, it's just like, you know. And and I was the reinspect on it, okay. And first guy did his job right, everything else. And um, so I just, I just talked to the guy, and I'm trying to explain to him this is why we're this is what's going on with it. I said, you have all this damage. I said, but your chicken coop over there with that very thin metal corrugated metal has no damage. Yeah. No. You know, how does all this have all this big damage, and then that has none. You know, did he do it or did somebody get up on his roof and do so it? So his cousin worked for a trying to help worked for a home restoration company. And he said that he wanted to come out and look at his roof and it says he goes, Well, I'm busy tomorrow, I've got to go to the VA hospital, or whatever. And uh he goes, Well, I'll stop by while you're gone. Oh, man. And so his cousin took the hammer to the roof and he had a little gust house too and took the so the roof was hit. He hit all the soft metal. I mean, he hit all. I mean, he hit the turtle vents. He hit everything, you know. But it's obvious what you're, you're looking at. I mean, it's of course there's no damage this far from the the edge. The edge, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you you went down a ridge, okay. Right, left, right, left, right, left, foot spaced apart. You know what the heck? Every and on one ridge, every single. This is going to be a home run. Nobody. Will every guess. single shingle on one ridge was was hit. You know, every single one was hit right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Except for that, you know, yep. uh, two foot, three foot from the, the, from edge. the edge. And um, and then on the on the little guest house, there was, it was, you could tell he did that from the ladder because it, it was a nice arc. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice arc on that one. And, um, you know, I, and I explained it to him and I said, sir, I'm sorry. It's not, it's, it's, you know, this is what it is and I can't cover it as a hell claim at the moment and I said well let me see what can get done on this and I called the manager and told the manager what, what happened I said just go ahead and write it put it in your notes what's going on you know and everything else and I think they covered it under vandalism yeah that's what they covered it because it's obvious I mean it's obvious this guy couldn't get on his own roof right you know it's obvious he could so they gave him the benefit of the doubt and, and I'm sure we saved it plus the guy being a veteran and, and everything else it was a lot of and who the carrier was you sure, know, yeah. uh, they, I think they just stood behind him, and yeah. it was it was obviously he didn't do it. Yeah. You know, I mean, guy could barely walk. Yeah, you know, so that's it, man. I mean, what you got? So uh, we're talking about cars. 
yeah. in, in, in vehicles. And and um, I remember when I bought my car that I was having a difficult time with the seat belt, but then it clicked. Okay. I mean, right. I guess, you know, if you want me to laugh, okay. I can try. Right, you know, <laughs> that's it. This is Adjuster TV.